Pisa Bot. Um, uh, this morning we are going to talk about cervical cancer. So this is the start of a three-part series. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking a, a bit on uh, cervical cancer. My name is Denning Masara, and let me offer a word of prayer so that you can get right into it. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this day thanking you for the fire you brought us. We want to invoke your presence. Even as you're about to indulge in the health nugget, please let us be able to gain from it. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah, so as I said, today we are going to start on a three-part series that's going to run uh, this week, next week, and the week after on uh, cervical cancer. So uh, the, the second slide is telling us that this is Cervical Cancer Awareness Month. So January is normally Cervical Cancer Awareness Month, and we want to increase, increase uh, knowledge about the condition. So uh, my table of contents will cover one, the definition, two, epidemiology, three, risk factors, four, symptoms and clinical presentations of cervical cancer, five, diagnosis, and six, prevention. So what is cervical cancer? So cervical cancer, by definition, is, an, is a constellation of abnormal growth of cells in a woman's cervix. So the cervix is the part, uh, just, uh, it's, a, it's a part in the female uh, genital system that's in between the uterus, which is the womb, and the birth canal. So uh, on definition of other terms that I'd like us to get because we'll use them along the presentation is a lesion. Basically, a lesion is a focus of damaged cells uh, in, uh, in the tissues of an organism, usually caused by trauma uh, or, uh, or, a disease, or a disease process. And the other term I'd like us to define is dysplasia. So dysplasia is a term used to define the presence of abnormal cells within a tissue or, or an organ. So a bit of epidemiology. So uh, we are going to talk about uh, the cervical cancer epidemiology and the HPV uh, epidemiology. So uh, a thing that we'll have to bear in mind is that a human papilloma virus, uh, formerly, uh, which is called uh, HPV in other terms, is the most common sexually transmitted infection. So persistent uh, high-risk HPVs are, necessary to, uh, are, are a necessary agent implicated in the causation of cervical cancer. So we have over 200 strains of human papilloma viruses, but the, one of, the ones of interest to us today are the strains type 16 and type 18. These ones are the ones which have been mostly implicated in the formation of cervical cancer in females. And they actually account for about 70% of, uh, of uh, cervical cancer, the, the type 16 and 18. So about 9.1% of women in the general population are, are, are believed to harbor the humans, uh, are, are believed to have, harbor the human papilloma virus, 16 and 18 infection at any given time. That's a really worrying statistic. So the infection occurs both in men and women, with the highest prevalence being among females of the re reproductive age groups, which is between ages 20 to 25. Uh, it is typically acquired soon after the onset of uh, sexual activity. So some studies actually suggest that three in every four individuals who are, are sexually active will get a HPV infection at some point in their lifetime resources approximating this figure to come close to 80% of the entire population. So what are the risk factors that predispose us to get a human papilloma virus infection which will give us cervical cancer? So the following are the, uh, are the risks that we have for cervical cancer. Now the risks have been established by, clear, by studies, randomized clinical trials, and the highest levels of evidence. So number one would be a greater number of sexual partners. For example, uh, among commercial sex workers, you have a fourfold increase in the likelihood of attaining cervical cancer. The other, number two, uh, the age at first sexual debut. So if sexual debut was uh, earlier than the age of 18, you have a twofold increase uh, in, in, uh, in, co in acquiring cervical cancer. And, and this, figure, uh, is, is, uh, this figure is revised upwards to 26-fold within one edge of, uh, of onset of debut within your menarche. Basically, menarche is, that, uh, is the first, is the first uh, period that a lady has. So if a lady has a coitus within uh, one, one year within, uh, within menarche, 
which is your first period, there's a 26-fold increased risk of uh, attaining cervical cancer and HPV. So the other risk factor will be multiple births. So the rationale in this is that this correlates with uh, increased uh, activity of coitus and so increased exposure to HPV virus infection, which will eventually lead to cancer. So the other, the other risk factor is childbirth below 19 years. So we currently have uh, massive drives that uh, prevent teenage pregnancies, and you can see these are one, some, of the common, uh, some of the common calamities that, uh, that plague uh, young children who, uh, occur, who, who tend to get into early marriages and things like that. The other risk factor will be current smoking. This uh, increases your risk by one, one and a half times to three times uh, risk of uh, getting uh, uh, cervical cancer. So smoking will also increase your risk of getting a persistent human papilloma virus infection. So uh, ideally, once you get a human papilloma virus infection, we expect that infection to clear in about two years, in 90% of HPV infections. But in case it goes more than two years, now that is a clinically established a persistent infection. And some of the factors that give you a persistent HPV infection include smoking and taking alcohol. So you can take an example of a young lady who, who is active, who has already had a debut, a sexual debut, and is smoking and, 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 is, uh, is, smoking and is, uh, is on alcohol. This increases your risk of uh, cervical cancer multifold. Um, uh, the, another thing we normally say is black ethnicity or Hispanic ethnicity. So the Latinos in the black races are at, at an increased risk. The other risk factor will be uh, use of uh, oral contraceptives for more than five years. This increases your risk two times. Uh, some uh, studies have been done and have shown that intrauterine devices, for example the Copati, is associated with a lower risk. It's actually protective. That's why we say it's a negative risk factor. So it confers benefit to patients, as opposed to the oral contraceptives. Those are, those are the ones that have an adverse risk factor. The other would be a history of uh, sex, other sexually transmitted infections, uh, like gonorrhea and chlamydia. Those increase your risk uh, multifold because you have, uh, you have weak points in the genital tract because of inflammation from these uh, uh, sexually transmitted infections. The other risk will be immunosuppression, for example, immune, uh, for example, HIV infection. We've already alluded to the fact that we rely on our immunity to help us to clear the human papilloma virus within two years in 90% of the cases. The other risk factor will be familial uh, history of cervical cancer. So this means that we have a genetic predisposition. Normally, uh, there's something we normally say in medicine. So you have, uh, you have, uh, you have a gun. So the gun is going to be loaded. So your genetics will load the gun. For example, take a young lady who has a familial history of cervical cancer. So already there you have a loaded gun, a cocked gun that's loaded. The thing now that will cause you to pull the trigger are your environmental influences. For example, smoking and taking of alcohol, and now uh, sexual indiscretion. Now those are the things that will pull the trigger to the already loaded gun. And from there on, you have a full-fledged cervical cancer uh, infection, uh, condition starting to develop. The other risk factor is social economic status. Uh, other, other risk factors would be like male circumcision. It confers benefit to ladies. So how does HPV cause cervical cancer? So over here, you have a nice pictorial showing uh, the, the, the layering of cells around the cervical region. So we, you see over here, we have a mucosal defect. Now that mucosal defect provides a nice avenue for viral particles to enter after sexual exposure. Now these virus will go and infect epithelial cells that we are seeing down there. Once the virus infects the cells, uh, it takes over the cell machinery of the cell. So it will integrate its own D DNA genome into our own DNA sequence. So what that will in fact do, it will enable the virus to produce its own proteins, uh, some adverse proteins we call oncoproteins. Now these proteins have a suppressive, uh, suppressive effect on the tumor suppressive mechanism of our cells. Now our cells have normal, uh, normal uh, regulatory mechanisms to get rid of tumors that are called the tumor suppressive uh, proteins. Now the virus will inhibit the tumor suppressive proteins and now that when you have a double negation, you have a, you have a net positive effect. 
So your cells go on overdrive. Unchecked proliferation, you have a tumorous mass of cells with cancerous potential. From there on, you have a full-fledged cancer. And we can see that in the purple diagram over there. So from here, you see, from the next diagram, you can see the nice cellular architecture depicted by the cells on the left. And as you progress towards the right, you have a full-fledged dysplastic cell, which is cancerous. The ones that you are seeing falling down, those are cells that have full mal malignant capability. So early on, in the mild dysplasia, moderate dysplasia phase, it's an irreversible pro process. Once your, your body clears that uh, human papilloma virus infection, you are able to regress and be able to be healed. But once it progresses to the level where you are seeing CIN2, CIN3, we need to intervene so that we prevent formation of a full-fledged cancer, which is indicated there by the term invasive carcinoma. So uh, what we normally do, uh, we normally do pap, pap, uh, pap screens uh, to, you, you, you guys normally hear of pap smears. A lady has gone for a pap smear to, to get screened. So ideally what that does essentially is to pick out this process before you get to the full-fledged uh, full uh, cancerous cell. It will pick it out in this stage of CIN1, CIN2. From there on, we can intervene uh, accordingly. So these cells are undergoing perpetual, uh, are undergoing a constant state of inflammation that eventually leads to cancer. So what are the common symptoms of cervical cancer? So usually the early symptoms of ca cervical cancer will include one, abnormal uterine bleed. Say uh, you expect your bleeding to go from day one to somewhere about day five. So between, between day five of your cycle and day 28, you are not expecting to see any, any bleeding or spotting. So that is normally potent and ominous prognosis. And uh, another thing will be postcoital bleed uh, and abnormal vaginal discharge. These are some of the early signs. But uh, typically, when you have a precancerous lesion, like the cells I showed you earlier, uh, now that cannot, uh, does not usually exhibit symptoms. So it is incumbent, the onus is on us, as, uh, as okay, the ladies, to go and get regular checkups. And that uh, process from a precancerous cell to a full-fledged cancer takes between 10 to 20 years. So a precancerous cell uh, will normally uh, tend to uh, uh, occur around the age of 25. So the peak incidence of cervical cancer is between 35 to 45. So you can see from the time you have a, a precancerous lesion, which is 25, to somewhere between 35 and, 40, uh, and 45, that's 10 to 20 years that you have that uh, temporal sequence of the change of cells that I showed you in the earlier slide. So diagnostics, that will entail screening. Uh, two, uh, after screening, which we normally do pap smear, you'll want to visualize using a microscope and thereafter take a biopsy from the abnormal cells. So uh, in the diagnostics, we've already talked of the pap smear, which basically uh, uh, long brushes put into the genital tract and uh, fluid uh, taken from that sample and smeared on cells. And then a pathologist will look at that under a microscope, essentially. If abnormalities are noted, the next thing you'll want to do is escalate and do a human papilloma virus DNA test. Now, if the pathologist went and saw from the pap smear that there appears to be a typical cells, dysplastic cells, uh, ideally you're supposed to do a HPV DNA test to see whether it's a high risk uh, strains of human papilloma virus that the lady has acquired. Then uh, regarding, regarding uh, screening recommendations, initially uh, previous society guidelines used to talk about the age of 21. Uh, but, now we, but now with revised guidelines, uh, screening is supposed to start at the age of 25. So uh, testing which, uh, with the DNA test is between uh, 25 to, to 65 years and is to be done every five years. If you have a core test between a HPV DNA and a pap smear, you are allowed to, to, to do that after every, every three or five years. Then you are normally supposed to stop. You are, out of, you are not out of the woods until you are 70 years of age. 70 years of age is when you can stop uh, undergoing cervical screens. If you have more than three uh, pap smears which show an, 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 uh, non, non reactive uh, results. So there are uh, ways that you uh, get the sample using the colposcope. Uh, then the image over there shows a, a, a technician or a clini clinician uh, using a colposcope to, uh, uh, to visualize the, the genital tract. So uh, you have some things called colonization procedures. Basically, these are uh, procedures used to 
uh, sort of uh, locally destroy cancerous cells around the, Asia, around the area. So you can use laser, you can use electricity, or you can use a cold knife, which is a mini surgical procedure. So what are the sure ways to reduce the likelihood? Exercise and temperance, vaccination, frequent testing and screening, adequate health-seeking behavior goes a long way in prevention. So a HPV vaccine, that should come first. So there's a vaccine called Gardasil 9, rolled out in 2015. Uh, as late as 2018, the FDA approved it for ages uh, 26 through 45. So most of us can benefit from that. Uh, so uh, the key point, the take-home message is pap smears have reduced, have halved the number, the number of cancers. And this has gone a long way in preventing cervical cancer deaths. So the thing is, we want to increase uh, awareness and increase the number of women that are going pap smears so that we don't get presentation uh, later on. Let presentation, which is the case, the third stage, most of our, case, uh, our patients present in around stage four, which is way advanced disease. So kindly find attached at the end of my presentation links from uh, various society guidelines around the world uh, giving you uh, patient information. Now these are leaflets, uh, which is easier to, it's, not, it's devoid of the medical jargon that we normally have. And these are things that patients and, the, and, and all of us can read. So kindly find attached those uh, leaflets and brochures under the resources uh, section of my presentation and kindly go look at them. It won't take much of your time. And that is the end of my presentation. So the rest, the rest of them, I've had to rush a bit through because uh, it's actually a really exhaustive topic and we can't really exhaust it in, uh, in 15 minutes. So the, the subsequent uh, areas, for example, the therapeutic approaches will be discussed in the subsequent series. Thank you very much and thank you for your valiant company.